Uh, we're here with uh, at Mundo with Richard Moore. Richard, uh, hi, welcome to Mundo. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, and um, Richard, I understand you've had an amazing life for over 40 years. You've been in the uh, offshore industry, in the wealth industry. You've been in private banking. You've worked with royalty, some of the most famous people in the world. And, and uh, you've had a fascinating life. Could you tell me a little bit about your background? I went to school in Scotland and then University in Canada, then in London, London School of Economics, then in Paris, the Institute of Political Studies, then started my banking career in Switzerland. I was trained in portfolio management, specialized in private clients and their issues. And then from private banking, I moved into the insurance market. Now I specialize in what's called international market access. I take companies to new countries and advise individuals on new jurisdictions. Richard, I understand that now uh, you're founder of Wealth Forums, and Wealth Forums, as I understand, is a networking community to introduce people from all over the world to each other uh, in order to facilitate business. The Wealth Forum is a unique networking organization, and uh, it's founded using the motto networks equal net worth. We've started to organize events in different jurisdictions using our networks and providing the possibilities for like-minded people, mostly private clients, principals of family offices, etc., to network with individuals uh, from similar walks of life. And that way, by networking with other people who had similar issues to deal with, uh, you often arrive at a better solution. Our first event was held in Monaco. Uh, we've had two since then. We've got another one coming up in May. We've had a Swiss Wealth Forum. We've had a London Wealth Forum. And we've just had the inaugural Panama Wealth Forum. Now, uh, the Wealth Forums is a British company. And as you heard by virtue of the fact world trade, the Wealth Forums promotes world trade. So, Richard, I understand. Let, let... From what you're saying, let's say you were a wealthy Panamanian family and you had like lots of projects and real estate investment, whatever. Uh, how would you, and say you wanted some connections with people in London who could invest in Panama or, or you could wanted to invest in London. How would they could come to you and, and you could facilitate that? Panama strategically located. It's a trading hub for this part of the world. Uh, the UK is a great trading partner for Panama, again, as a hub for a center of excellence in shipping and insurance, in legislation, one of the largest uh, sources of UK export to Panama is whiskey. Diageo, for example, have a big presence here in the free port zone, and it's designed as their hub to trade with all of Latin American whiskey. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline, another key UK company, have a presence here for manufacturing and distribution regionally. And then, of course, you've got um, JCB, manufacturers of heavy equipment, who are also here. Again, thinking about hubs, Panama is certainly a hub for the UK, and our trade has certainly improved. We're now, in terms of the hierarchy of countries that invest in Panama, America is number one, Colombia number two, Switzerland number three, UK number four. We import lots of fruit, coffee uh, from Panama, among other things. But what do we get in return? It's about equivalent of 239 uh, million at the moment. It can only go one way, that's better. Richard, I see something on your uh, lapel, a badge. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that is and what that means? Uh, that represents the City of London, and uh, I'm a member, as I said earlier, of the Worshipful Company of World Traders, and I'm also a Freeman of the City of London. One of the privileges of being a Freeman is you can drive sheep over Tower Bridge. I've never done it, but anyhow. And by virtue of being a Freeman, you can also have the right to vote in, in elections in the City of London for the corporation to elect the councillors, the aldermen, and the mayor. Now, the City of London counts for at least 3% of the whole GDP of the United Kingdom. So when you think of such a small place generating that type of income, clearly uh, it's very important for the United Kingdom as a whole because it's a center of excellence. It might not produce anything material, but in terms of know-how, expertise, invisible income or invisibles as they're called, uh, you can't beat the city of London. It is a world-class city. I 
like that you mentioned uh, Freeman, because we are exploring the concept of freedom uh, in, in Mundo. Uh, what else does Freeman mean? It also means certain freedoms and privileges from, go from other governments and institutions. Is that Would that be correct? Freedom of the City of London enables you to vote in the elections for the corporation. To be clear, the City of London has its own mayor, the Lord Mayor. London, as a city, is comprised of 32 boroughs. And most people tend to confound the role of the Lord Mayor of the City of London. And then you've got the Mayor of London. And then you've got the 32 boroughs who also have their own mayors and they're responsible at the micro level for their boroughs. Lord Mayor of the City of London, he represents the corporation of the City of London, the so-called square mile. And then you've got the Mayor of London who deals with pan-London issues. The Mayor of the corporation, the Lord Mayor of the corporation of the City of London only deals with the local issues within the boundaries of the City of London per se. However, because he represents so much money and he represents livery companies and all the professions that are located within the city when he travels he has full diplomatic rank not even the mayor of london has that but um my question also was more direct to the city of london corporation i won't use the words tax free but it does have certain tax privileges uh, the corporation of the city of london is the local authority which runs the city. No, the City of London doesn't make legislation. They make local rules uh, which apply to what goes on within the city. They give planning permission for building and demolition, etc. But they don't impact on legislation other than when it comes to maintaining peace and quietude and cleanliness within the boundaries of the corporation's jurisdictional area. England set up a number of, uh, I'll call them, for want of a better word, dependencies such as, or territories such as the Cayman. And they have their own independent uh, tax status and uh, uh, they're very useful for tax planning. Can you um, elaborate on how uh, London, England, or maybe the City of London uh, has, has historically set these uh, satellite uh, countries up together and how it works? Uh, there are only 12 remaining overseas dependent territories. The UK would be responsible for foreign policy and defense, but when it comes to internal self-government, places like Bermuda are responsible for their own income. In some cases, uh, they've done better than others. Uh, let's take Bermuda, for example. In the late 80s, when Lloyd's was going through a crisis, the reinsurance market uh, developed uh, greatly in Bermuda, and it's thanks to reinsurance that Lloyd's still survives today. And thanks to Bermuda especially. So there's great interdependence for London, City of London and Bermuda. When it comes to um, structuring, uh, you think right away of British Virgin Islands and BVI companies, very popular, particularly of recent times with Chinese using BVI companies and then reinvesting in the UK, BVI companies have also been used by other nationalities as vehicles to uh, buy UK assets. And then when it comes to funds, hedge funds have set up in Cayman Islands, again, run from London, but based in, in Cayman for tax efficient and time zone purposes, especially if you're dealing with the American market. And so each, each country has been able to find its own niche. Now, we mustn't forget the Falkland Islands. Well, what, what do they offer the UK? Hopefully more tourism. Uh, they're trying to create more infrastructure there. And as our relations improve with Argentina, who knows, there may be some solution found to this issue. Now, you're also, as I understand, heavily involved with Ireland. Could, could you tell our readers a little bit about the potential of Ireland as a lifestyle and investment destination? Sure, with pleasure. Well, heavily involved. I started off in the last century, let's say, because I was quite keen on film industry. And I was working with a law firm called Arthur Cox, who were one of the pioneers in the Irish film financing business. And so um, that got me interested in Ireland, gone back regularly ever since. Ireland now have a very interesting initiative, which is called Connect Ireland. They also have an Irish diaspora uh, loan fund, uh, which is designed to attract 
not just from the Irish diaspora, but also those who have an interest or sympathy with Ireland and things Irish, uh, they can also invest in Ireland and that can lead to uh, residential status and ultimately citizenship. And this is what they've been promoting over the last few months. Now, I understand with the Brexit, Ireland may be much more important uh, as, as an investment destination. And could you say why? Because it will remain within the European Union. And already, because of the uncertainty which Brexit has engendered, because we don't know uh, what's going to happen, there are several large companies that are moving or introducing, well, we talk about Plan B, this is Plan I for Ireland, of course, who are setting up uh, offices in Dublin uh, to hedge their bets because no one, as I say, knows what the negotiations will produce uh, in terms of a new treaty. Well, you see, Brexit also could have other uh, unintended consequences, of which one is Sexit. And Sexit, in this sense, for me, means Scottish independence. Uh, because, of course, the Scots voted to remain within the European Union, as did the majority of people in Northern Ireland, by the way. And so this is presenting the current Conservative government uh, with a big problem, because, you know, they're going for Brexit, but you've got the constituent parts of the United Kingdom, at least two of them, who wish to remain. So that is something that's very difficult to resolve. Now, I understand uh, you. it may be in the air to have a Welsh Forum in Ireland. Oh, most, most definitely. One, because uh, Ireland is a great destination for inward investment. I've had discussions with people in the government, particularly those that represent the IDLF and Connect Ireland, and they're very keen to do so. We will do an Irish Wealth Forum, which will promote uh, Irish companies, Irish real estate to those who would be interested to come and see and talk about inward investment. What do you think about Ireland? Like a lot of companies uh, are interested in having a hub or a center of management in Europe. Let's say Latin American uh, companies or family offices who want to trade their products from Latin America into Europe. Would Ireland be a good destination for that and why? Uh, most definitely. Uh, obvious answer, first of all, low corporation tax, 12%. Uh, in terms of quality of life, uh, great place to work from, raise a family, uh, safe. You're in Europe. You can actually use Ireland as a platform because with Brexit coming about, Ireland will provide you also all being well exclusive or great access to the UK market as well as the European market. Plus Ireland has lots of other bilateral treaties with other jurisdictions beyond the European Union. So Ireland is a platform for international trading, whether it's with North America, Europe and beyond. Uh, Ireland certainly more than ticks the boxes. Plus, as I said, you've got Dublin as an international financial center and you've got a very talented, dynamic, young, population who are highly qualified, so I don't really think you can find any better. They speak English too, of course, which is very useful. And what's the minimum residency requirements in, for investment purposes? Um, five years, but I think um, that can be discussed. But I mean the minimum investment for residency? Um, about a million euro. Again, it's tailor-made. You can discuss these issues, certainly not less than that. And it depends on projects and the ideas that you create jobs for Irish people, but if you wanted to uh, buy property there and so on, I don't foresee a problem. The Irish want to distinguish themselves from other jurisdictions which offer citizenship by investment. So they're trying to make this as tailor-made as they possibly can. And what are your impressions of Panama so far? Well, um, I've always had dealings with Panama, but physically never actually been here until the other day. So actually, I'm pleasantly surprised and impressed. As a hub, I told you what I know. I think there's great potential here, not just as, as a country itself, but if you think of Panama as a hub for the whole Latin America region, it's a great place from which to do business. You know, set up a Panamanian company which can trade throughout the whole region because you've got a whole framework of treaties which enable you to do so, whereas if you were just a British company by itself, you wouldn't have the passporting rights which you have by virtue of being a Panama entity, nor do you have the tax-efficient advantages 
which you do have here by virtue of being in the Freeport. So hopefully there'll be more Guinness in Panama and more rum in Ireland. Who knows? Uh, no, that we're only limited by our own imaginations, and I think Panama has certainly great potential. Well, thank you for agreeing to appear on Mundo, and we hope to see more of you. Oh, my pleasure.